ever noticed how the fashion industry has always challenged societal norms? Think of fashion subcultures like the hippie subculture that began as a youth movement in America as a direct result of various national and international struggles that defined the 1950s. Or heroin chic of the 1990s that popularized pale skin, emaciated features, androgyny and stringy hair. Traits associated with the excessive use of heroin and other drugs. Or even street fashion that's now making its way to high fashion thanks to designers like the late Virgil Abloh. Fashion has always challenged what is mainstream and universally accepted. It's given those who have been oppressed and ignored by existing norms and systems a voice. Hi, my name is Anne. Once a designer in the fashion industry trying to help people find or create a style they love and feel their most confident selves in, and today, an MBA Fellow at the Institute for Gender and the Economy at the University of Toronto. In the next few minutes, I'll be examining what the industry has done to address yet another societal norm, that of gender expression. The fashion industry has always been experimenting with gender. Think of smoking suits for women by Yves Saint Laurent or the androgynous style of so many musicians like Elvis Presley, Lady Gaga and now even Harry Styles. Until the 19th century, there wasn't much of a gender distinction in dress. Men in colourful suits, ornate jewellery and embroidered shirts and believe it or not, even high-heeled shoes were considered very masculine. Fashion was not feminized then. Intricacy in dress was used to signify the status of the wearer in society. Things changed since the 19th century as gender representation became stronger than societal class. Since the 20th century, clothes have lost their economic relevance but retained their symbolic importance. Clothes are available in all price ranges to suit all pockets now. Those with limited resources can create personal styles which are an expression of their identities rather than imitating the styles of the affluent. But the evolving conversation on gender equity and gender roles led to a blurring of lines in what's considered masculine and feminine. In fact, in the 1970s, the famous costume designer of the TV show Space 1999, Rudy Jonreich, even predicted that by the year 2000, clothing would no longer be binary or identified as male or female. But before we take a closer look at what's happening now, let's understand what gender is and how it is different from biological sex. Research suggests that the word gender was used as early as the 15th century to describe the culturally constructed expression of sexual difference. One could argue that it is in many ways a huge part of social organization and it has conventionally been used for classification like division of roles, changing rooms, etc. While many link gender with biological sex, there are many who argue differently. Simone de Beauvoir in the 1940s, for instance, once argued that one is not born but rather becomes a woman. She contended that the ideals of gender are socially constructed and so being born female should never limit one to stereotypically feminine characteristics. An interesting way to think of gender is as a continuum. That is, if we have the ultimate masculine identity on one end of the continuum and the ultimate feminine identity on the other, and acknowledge that as human beings we all have both male and female attributes like ambition, independence, sensitivity, etc., then we can also acknowledge that gender is actually very different from biological sex because as we fall on different points of this continuum, completely new and distinct identities emerge. According to many working in the field of fashion, Gender is performed by individuals and clothing and dress is integral to this performance as it is the medium of presentation. And so when it comes to understanding our progress towards gender equity across roles, cultures, industries and across geographies, taking a close look at what the fashion and clothing industries are doing and creating and what people are wearing becomes crucial. They act as a window into how society maintains gender differences at a particular point in time. So what's happening now? 
today we're seeing more and more designers and artists embrace gender fluidity in their work. We've begun talking about camp at the Met Gala, an aesthetic in which something has appeal because of its ironic, exaggerated, theatrical, effeminate or gender non-conforming behavior. We've seen artists like Doja Cat and Lil Nas take this fashion to the global stage. We're seeing more designers like Telfa Clemens, Harris Reed, etc. commit their brands and their time to creating genderless and unisex clothing. More shows like Pose and RuPaul's Drag Race that celebrate drag and cross-dressing. And we're definitely seeing more imagery on social media and on the runway with models like Andrea Pejic, Cara Delevingne and Leah T. But if fashion has always been playing with gender norms, why is it that its experiments are only becoming mainstream now? Many in the industry believe that it is because the dialogue around gender equity in society has evolved and trends spread faster today than ever before owing to the internet. Dress codes are losing prevalence as symbols of social class are less important. Even at work, as creativity is more and more required and companies are realizing that creativity needs space to explore, people are encouraged to come as they are, express themselves and be comfortable. As the appreciation for fashion has grown, fashion has also become democratized. Fast fashion brands like H&M and Zara try to bring trends to the larger audience at inexpensive prices. The industry has also been criticized time and again for its contribution to environmental damage and more and more brands are committing to making a difference. But despite all the progress, it's still difficult to find a section in most stores that's genderless or gender fluid and those wanting to experiment with style need to shop in the other gender section. We know now that gender isn't perfectly binary. So why should clothes be? I spoke to six designers as part of my research in the field from Canada, India and the UK working in various types of establishments. Entrepreneurs and founders, freelancers and some creative directors and designers at major brands. And I've tried to get a worm's eye view of how far the conversation on gender has progressed in the industry. I was surprised to find that it's harder to do this work than one would expect. First, the industry has a gender problem. Many brands and companies are still at a point where they differentiate between male and female sexes in hiring, promotions, etc. They haven't yet begun discussing what it's like for different gender groups and identities. In fact, even though the fashion industry has a female face, it has a glass runway. According to reports by McKinsey and PwC, only 14% of major brands have female managers in executive positions. To progress in the industry, according to the designers I spoke with, one needs to stand out and be different. There are fewer opportunities for individuals who are not stereotypically male in managerial positions as men are assumed to be better at business. On the flip side, my interviewees indicated that gender non-conforming individuals are assumed to be more creative. One of my interviewees from the UK, who is a creative director at a major brand and a founder of his own, described the paradox he observed in the industry. He recalled a fairly recent incident where he felt the urge to experiment with his style and paint his nails white. The first question they asked me was, are you gay? He exclaimed as he described the reactions from his peers in the workplace. He said he instantly felt scared for his safety and awkward because just describing a creative urge had led him to being looked at differently and get judged in a place where style and expression should have been celebrated. It gets harder as you climb the corporate ladder, one of my interviewees, a designer from Canada, described. She said it's a real-life Devil Wears Prada experience because one automatically gets uninteresting and boring if one doesn't do something unusual. Individuals identifying with different gender groups have described feeling confused at their organization's inability to understand their emotional and psychological needs. One interviewee, a gender non-conforming designer from India, recounted how stereotypically female individuals were permitted to leave the office premises early for their safety as these offices or factories were often in remote parts of the country where there isn't much awareness of the different gender groups and forms of expression. He went on to describe how against this backdrop, 
he as a gender non-conforming male wasn't safe either. But he wasn't granted any privileges, however, and this sent a confusing signal to others like him in organizations. The difficulties my interviewees faced within their organizations had me wondering how it is then that so many gender fluid collections make it to fashion week and also why these collections rarely ever make it to stores for the average shopper like you and me to purchase. Here's what I learned. The viewers who attend these shows are not necessarily those who generate commercial sales for the brands. My interviewees described how the goal of a fashion week is so different from the goal of collections that make it to trade shows and eventually to the stores. It's at fashion week that garments are created to sell stories of an escape from reality, where shock value is actually appreciated. One of my interviewees, a founder of an inclusive brand for men in India, explained this to me in more detail. He told me how it's difficult for designers and brands to sustain a business that's solely for gender-fluid individuals. Because in many parts of the world, like in India, so many socio-economic factors keep gender non-conforming individuals from decent paying jobs and therefore the ability to afford designer clothing. Established brands risk upsetting their existing customers who may be more conservative or less aware and thereby lose out on profits and so they avoid taking the risk of experimenting with something as sensitive as the image of their brand. But the customer isn't the only stakeholder they're afraid of upsetting. One of my interviewees, a designer from the UK, describes himself as a maker, a creator for humans regardless of sex. As he travels to different locations and pitches his new brand to investors for funding, he finds that he has no choice but to declare who his target market is and be explicit about his brand's image. The investor doesn't want something vague, he says. They need business. Now that we've examined the organizations and the people who operate in this ecosystem, let's take a close look at the systems in place to ensure a company's success in this competitive industry. I learned that with rapid digitization and the introduction of AI, Everything is now automated in many firms, whether it's manufacturing, planning or design. While this technology has made it possible for companies to operate at light speed and without error, it also reinforces biases. Today, in many companies, models and AI are used to forecast future sales based on historical records. As my interviewees indicated, these systems don't take into account the fact that conversations around gender and the environment are evolving and therefore demand for sustainable inclusive clothing is also changing. The problem is, brands are afraid to cause any disruption to these systems and technologies they've invested so much in building because much of their success has been attributed to these models to begin with. But what can we do now that we know all of this as consumers, leaders, viewers, teachers, or lovers of fashion? If you're faculty, help dismantle gender norms in your school. And if you're a student, actively champion for changes in the curriculum to make it more inclusive. My interviewees indicated that at present, even in some of the most prominent and progressive schools in the world, if one wants to pursue a higher education in fashion, one needs to declare if it needs to be a master's in menswear or a master's in womenswear. We really need to use our voices to champion for change and inclusion at this point in a designer's journey with fashion and equip them with the skills they need to design for different gender groups with diverse body types. If you own a brand, improve your diversity hiring targets and inclusion policies to tackle the inequity that's embedded in the organization and its systems. Increase board diversity and ensure leaders represent the needs of different cultures, gender groups, abilities, etc. Train the leaders to hire and promote based on merit and capabilities rather than the identities of the employees. People are large and intersectional and creating environments within your organizations that normalize self-expression will not only help address some of the imbalances that exist in society today, but will also give creative individuals in your teams the space and the confidence they need to explore, experiment and push the boundaries of innovation. 
One of my interviewees, a designer at a prominent luxury brand in India, talked about a tradition at his workplace, an annual gala where people could come dressed however they wanted. He'd design and create these elaborate and fabulous gowns for himself and he'd always be awarded the prize for being best dressed. But he said this wasn't his everyday experience. On a regular day, he had to come to office in full pants and a shirt because others in his workplace weren't used to seeing people dress in a gender non-conforming way. And he said, I wish the gala wasn't just a one-day affair. When individuals enter the workforce as adults, they come with a lot of biases. And so the way to create an awareness isn't to silence those who are affected by the current system, but to create policies that encourage new ways of self-expression to build that awareness. Finally, as a consumer of fashion and trends, vote with your wallet. Let the brands that are beating all the odds, risking their businesses and creating collections that help take us one step closer as a society to gender equity with the products and experiences they sell, know that you see them because that's the only way to incentivize them to continue doing what they're doing and influence other brands to follow suit.